Well, welcome back, everybody. I see you've come back for more. So remember, you deserve what you get. So seriously, though. Chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 today we begin there. And um, as most of these other chapters have gone, um, I, won't con I won't cover the whole chapter today. We'll stop just short of uh, actually the lesson on the full armor of God. So we're going to have the part that leads up to that and builds the si this stage for it and the case. Um, to the verse of the week this week was looking forward to next week because then the verse for next week is going to build on that. So I just wanted to give them to you in bite-sized chunks so rather than a big one all at once. But anyway, here we are, Ephesians chapter 6. And um, chapter 5 taught us that the ways of the world are the ways of those who live life as if there's no God. Remember we started out, don't live like the Gentiles do. Well, how do the Gentiles live, you know? Uh, what, if, what, if, what if they live just like us? No, well, but the Gentiles in his reference there means those who live as if there's no God. Uh, the Gentiles were, according to Jewish thought and everything, they were estranged from God. They, they were far from Him, and they couldn't come near to, to God. Even if a Gentile became a Jewish practitioner and, and proselytized into the Jewish religion, um, they still, whenever they would go to Jerusalem, they had to stay out in the court of the Gentiles. That's as close as they could get, right? So there always was a divide between anybody that wasn't of Israel and God. There was, they were in the way, so to speak. Along came one good Jew, though, and he died on the cross for us, and that changed everything. That opened it up wide open, you know, and uh, so he, he was, uh, anyway. Uh, we also learn in chapter 5, the immoral ways of the godless are not the ways for those called into the kingdom of God, so we are to live as children of the light. So don't live like the Gentiles do that don't have, that are living godless like there is no God. There is accountability. No matter what Darwinian evolution tries to teach our kids in school, there is a God, and you're accountable to Him. And the only reason to try to create a theory of origins that doesn't require a creator is because they don't want to be accountable to Him. They want to live as if there's no God. But there is one, and we're all accountable to him, whether you believe it or not. It is the truth of the matter. And uh, we implore them, be reconciled to God. And also came, Paul said that too. Anyway, uh, we're to take advantage of the time that we have left here on the earth. Make the best of the time that we have left. That came from out of chapter 5 too. To make the most of building his kingdom and making more disciples of Christ. Uh, converting uh, our resources here on earth that can't go to heaven into things that can. As a converting into heavenly currency is what we should be doing with the time that we have. Living as if we're leaving soon and we're never coming back. And what can we do to... to uh, take something with us. What can we take with us, right? And there's no U-Haul behind your hearse. Uh, so anyway, we're to try to become as full of the Spirit as a drunk is full of his booze. That was part of chapter 5 as well. Using the, the drunk who's totally under the influence as our example. We should be inf totally influenced by the Spirit. And, and by the way, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, so you're not going to act like a drunk in that. You're not going to mimic that behavior, but you're going to be that full of the Spirit of God, of the Holy Spirit. That's our goal. So... Um, Anyway, then the rest of the chapter taught us um, about the order of responsibility God has placed on our marriages with um, man supposing to be, uh, supposed to be uh, the image of Christ as head over the church and, and it displaying that level of self-sacrifice for those he came for. Right, And that's supposed to be the picture in the family, and the family is supposed to model that to the world. The church should be modeled and full of that kind of modeling so that the church can display this kind of lifestyle to the whole world. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. That's all of us. 
That's just not women having to submit to the man. No, we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's a, it's a Christ-like attitude to live selflessly. So now as we move into chapter 6, we're going to continue a little bit of the order of authority in the family here at the beginning. And um, I, 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 you know, if, if I'd have been the one that they asked, how do you want to break down these numbers on the chapters and everything, I would have done it different. You know, but I wasn't asked and, and I wasn't around back then. They did this way before I came along. And just remember, the chapter and verse numbers are not inspired. They weren't there originally. They're a road map so we know how to find our way around making references to certain parts of Scripture. So anyway, um, we're going to learn then, we're going to move in after we handled the family here a little bit more. Um, we're going to move into the Christian's battle armor will be the end of the chapter and how Paul will sign off there right before he says, Bye, y'all, you know, at the, at the very end. All right, so uh, verses 1 through 3 then, follow along with me. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. You know why? Because the old man's going to take you out if you dishonor him. No. I mean, I, I heard it described like that once, you know, but that's not really not what it, it means. But, uh, but, but first, when we look at this, who are the children? Who, when he says children, who's he talking to here? He's writing a letter to people that can read. Right? Because they're going to read this letter, or at least hear it read to them. You know, uh, so are we to break up part of it and this doesn't apply to you? It only applies to the little kids in junior church? You know, no. We need to think about this for a minute. Who are the children? They're offering, off, obviously, offspring of parents. Are you an offspring of parents? Okay. So, when he says children... He's talking to offspring of parents. If you have living parents, then you're still under this admonition here in this, okay? Because um, it's right. So, um, who does this command uh, apply to, and does it, when does it cease to apply? I don't know. I don't know that it does. Um, who are the parents? Since the reader is supposed to be believers, remember we established that at the outset of this book, the reader of this book is, is believer, uh, basically from a non-Jewish background, but you've got Jewish believers infiltrating the church early on, you know, but primarily to Gentile Christians is the primary audience of this letter. So, the parents... The reader is supposed to be uh, supposed believers, so these are parents of believers is the answer to who the parents are. Parents of believers. Because the children that are being talked to are the believers. Right? Now that that obvious thing is pointed out, just in case you wanted to try to make it somebody else, that's the only logical, reasonable assumption that you can come to out of this. So, um, what is meant by in the Lord would be the next thing that I would look at at, his, at this and, and, and stumble over. What does it mean to obey your parents in the Lord? Uh, you might think about that one for a second. Um, it kind of gives the idea that what is being tasked that you're supposed to obey you know, whatever it is that's being tasked does not contradict God's instructions. So that's kind of what I read this as when I say in the Lord means, that means so long as they're not giving you instructions that contradict what God's word says. Um, so in the Lord, obey them. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, what is meant by honor then? So this goes a little bit beyond. The next question is, you know, in the Lord, now we have honor. What, what, what is meant by honor? It goes beyond the simple obedience to also lifting up their honor, like defending their honor. Have you ever been in a position where you needed to do that? Defend the honor of your parents? Yeah, maybe. 
Maybe you have, and, and um, you know, but anyway, that would be kind of what we're taught here, is it's going beyond just a simple obedience to actually lifting up and defending their honor, and there's a level of protection here that's, that's called for uh, to the reader. So obedience is demanded of the children, but the parents must teach their children to obey because disobedience is inherited from the flesh nature, right? <laughs> the disobedience comes from the flesh nature, and, and they're going to inherit at that so and that needs to be taught too, taught obedience so anyway now let's take verse 4 by itself and let's look at verse 4 for a second fathers do not exasperate your children instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord so there's like a, a command but then an instead and and these two things being at odds with one another the way the, stru the sentence structure is brought up. In other words, if you're doing whatever you're doing that exasperates your children, you must not be uh, bringing them up in the training instruction of the Lord because that was the instead of exasperating them. So you see what I'm saying? If you're doing some, whatever your attitude and your, your uh, harsh, overbearing way might be turning them away. You know, not bringing them up in the, the instructions of the word. So the father is warned to not be so overly harsh and unreasonable to drive otherwise good children toward rebellion. Has that ever happened? Otherwise, good kids is driven towards rebellion because of the overly harsh parent, right? And by the way, this is just not fathers. I've known some mothers are some of the meanest people I've ever met. And, and you, I'll go to Walmart, you can hear them talking to their kids all the time. I'm embarrassed so many times for people in there, the way the language they'll use at their kids. Well, I got in the middle of one of them one time. I know I'm not supposed to act like that, but I said, wow, when they start talking like that, you can know where they learned it. Truth hurts a little bit now and then, you know. What's she going to do? You know, call the cops on me? I had a badge in my pocket at the time. Anyway, so... Anyway, the next uh, is the command to bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And there's no room here for the wishy-washy believing parent. Uh, I let my kids decide what they want to believe in. Oh, man, the 17 years in youth ministry, I saw it all. I saw parents, so many parents that would, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to let my child decide what to believe in. I'm not going to push belief, my belief on them. Well, then you don't believe, do you? That's not real belief. If I really believe something is true, something that important, I've got to tell them the truth. I'm, I'm ad, ad, what do you call it, advocating, <laughs> abdicating uh, my role as a parent if I don't teach them right and wrong. And if I believe the Word of God is true and God is real and God is, is uh, there f watching over us and we are accountable to Him and His Word is His Word, I better tell my kids that. I better make sure that they hear it. You know what I got to say? I, I have to say. I got I'm starting to talk like I'm hillbilly here. Anyway, um, I am grateful for the way my parents instilled in me the belief uh, of the Bible, uh, of Christianity. And, you know, I, they didn't just say, I'll let him come to his own, concu uh, his own uh, conclusions. Boy, I'm stumbling over all kinds. I'm trying to go too fast, I think, is the problem. I, slow down. All right, slow down. They taught me from infancy that Jesus, the Son of God, died for my sin. So, the, it was so that I could be saved from God's judgment and have eternal life. And I grew up knowing that was the truth because it was told to me that that's the truth. There was no, well, some people believe, and we kind of believe this, so if you choose to believe like us, this is what we believe. No, it was like, this is the truth. This is the truth, right? And I'm grateful for that because I didn't have, I didn't have a choice at, at that point. I, that choice was not given to me. You know why? Because it is the truth and they knew that truth. 
So they weren't wishy-washy and said, well, we'll just wait till he can start making decisions of his own and we'll present this as an option. Here's option A. This is what we think. But if you want to go to be a Tibetan monk or something like that or practice Eastern mysticism or whatever seems to be popular at your school th at this time, then that's, that's, up, that's options B, C, D, whatever. There are all your, many different options out there, Junior. You can just do whatever you like, you know. Parent needs a spanking. Need to be, God will probably take them to the woodshed someday, and it's going to be later on when they come to realize they knew the truth and they didn't share it. And then they've been taken to the woodshed emotionally when that happens. So, anyway, according to this passage of Scripture... It is the Christian parent's duty to teach their children the truth as truth, not as a possibility. Okay, so remember that and pass it on. All right, verses 5 and 6. Slaves. First of all, how many slaves we got here today? <laughs> Never mind. All right. Uh, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Okay, so the Bible doesn't condone human slavery. It doesn't. I've looked. It doesn't condone it. But there were slaves, since there were slaves, and some of them had responded to the gospel and were now believers, they're instructed on how to live as Christian slaves. Now that you're a Christian, you're still a slave, this is how a Christian slaves should act. And uh, so all Christians are to offer ourselves as slaves to Christ. So I was, I was being kind of tricky there a minute ago. How many slaves do we have here today? Every hand in the place should have been up on that. Because we're, we're commanded by Scripture to offer yourselves as a slave to Christ. We should be His slave. Whatever you're bidding, Master. All right? That should be the way we operate. That's the new nature, the, the, the spirit nature. The old flesh nature says, nah, he might make you do something you don't want to do. Or he might keep you from having fun. All right? All right, anyway. If a, if a Christian is a slave of another person, they are to consider it their Christian duty to be a good one and to serve as if serving Christ himself. And, and, and I, I said here, you know, Paul is writing this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because there are slaves out there and there were Christian slaves. How were they to act? If you can get your freedom, do so, but don't rebel. That's what he said in another letter he wrote. You know, don't be rebellious. Give them a good example. And, and serve them as if you're serving Christ himself. And wow, they're going to be pleased with you if you act that way. You know, you, you just might be the one that moves your slave owner uh, to think about it and maybe become a believer himself. You know, there was a whole letter that happened, you know, uh, about um, Paul writing to a guy that freed a slave. And it, that's another story. It's in another letter. But, um, but that's a pretty good one, too. Uh, anyway, we, we, we're taught, at least taught here that if you are in that circumstance, um, how should you live it? And now verses 7 and 8 kind of go along with that. Let's move to there now. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Now here's the concept of rewards in heaven for the good that you do. Now I have to say, in this, based on other verses, that it must jive with and not contradict based on other verses in the New Testament. This verse is talking about good meaning in the spirit. 
spirit-motivated and empowered deeds, okay? These are the good things that are, Paul is talking about. There are rewards for whenever we obey the Spirit. When we obey the leading of the Holy Spirit and do things that He's telling us to do, that's the good that is in mind here. Uh, so whatever that happens to be, there are, there, I'm not, there's not even a list because it's so broad what that could be. Whatever the Holy Spirit is moving you to do, that becomes good that you're rewarded for in heaven, right? And nobody outpays God. He pays the best wages ever, <laughs> okay? Anyway, um, we don't have slavery in this, in this country anymore, thank God. But we do have something that is sometimes close to it, and it's called employees, right? Uh, if you're not self-employed, but you rely on others to provide you with work and give you a paycheck for your time, then you should look at these instructions to the slaves and adhere to the same ethic. You consider yourself under that same title. So really, he could say, instead of slaves up there at the beginning of verse 5, he could say, employees, obey your earthly employer with respect and fear. It could, it could just, you could just change the words and the same would apply. If, you know, it, it still hits the same, right? So that is how you're supposed to work um, for them as if you're serving the Lord himself. Um, if, if you're not self-employed, like I said, then you're relying on them to, to provide you with work and compensate you for your time. So they're doing you a great service. They're really doing you a big favor <laughs> by having that job. It's, you know, that's why we should consider businesses and business development and things like that highly esteemed in a state like this instead of trying everything you can to, to run them out of the state and make them go somewhere else. Because they are investing back into the community by providing jobs for people. You know, if you chase them out of the state, they're not going to be here very long and all the people are going to leave because they need jobs, right? So anyway, that's my two cents on that one. Maybe a quarter, I don't know. So, but anyway, employers should be able to say that their Christian employees are the best and wish all the other people, all the other employees would become Christians too. I mean, think about it. I wish all my employees would become a Christian because these Christian employees are the best I ever had. But is that normally the truth? I mean, I have some people here that are employers today. And if I was to ask you, are your Christian employees always your best workers? You might say sometimes they're the biggest pain in the posterior. They might sometimes expect special favor just because they're my, they're my Christian brother or sister. Well, that's not right either. You know, it, it's still, you still, anyway. So... Masters, verse 9. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven is in... Is, well, let me back this up again. I'm tripping over my own tongue here. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism with him. So, here the instructions are not, Masters, free your slaves. He didn't say that. He could have. And, and there would have been a lot of good argument back in the slavery days for saying, see, none of you slave owners are obedient to the Word of God. Because the Word of God says, free your slaves. But it doesn't. It didn't say that. There was even in the Old Testament provision in the Mosaic Law for owning slaves. There was, there was how you treat them. How long, if they're Hebrew, how long can you keep them a slave? You have to free them uh, every so often. You know, there were rules for how to go about it. But you also treat them well. And you're not like the things that we all saw in the movies of Roots and all that kind of thing and the, the travesty things that happened back in this country during the days of slavery. Uh, it was just awful thing. And I'm glad that it doesn't happen anymore to anybody. Uh, but the Bible didn't say, Masters, free all your slaves. It just doesn't. Uh, 
I think maybe the Holy Spirit moving in a godly slave owner might have said, I'm going to free them. But then again, you'd have to look at the economy. If I free them, will they have anything to do? Do I turn them into an employee and say, you can continue to live here, and you'll get your board and all of that, and some pay or compensation or whatever, but now you're going to be my employee, not my slave. And you're free to go if you so choose, but wow, it's bad out there. And if you, if you take off in certain parts of the country, you may end up being a slave again. You know, So maybe you stay here under my protection uh, instead. That might have been the godly thing to do. But um, I've heard of stories, uh, actually, of the people that did that. That. people who did that and they used their wealth to buy more slaves and treat them and give them actual freedom but give them jobs and and keep them on the property and protected so that was that was probably the godly thing to do in that era uh, you know because it was more of a protecting nature of a big brother kind of a thing instead of uh, you know just say okay well I feel bad about this I'm gonna let you go go out there and God be with you you know Anyway, the instructions here, as I said, are not free your slaves, but since you have slaves, treat them well, remembering that your master in heaven is theirs too, right? You both have the same boss. You're just the foreman, that's all. And that's the thought that should have come out of this. Uh, you know, um, and he's not going to tolerate you mistreating his person, his slave, right? Especially, you know, they are one of his. He's not going to tolerate you mistreating them. And you won't get away with it for long. So, let's turn this over for the same for employers. If you mistreat or cheat your employees, it won't go over well with God. Right? You'll be punished by God for unjust treatment, unjust treatment of those you are over. Uh, he's not going to tolerate that. Your business is probably going to fail. That'd be good just punishment for that. You know, uh, but anyway, we should think about that. that. It all brings out the B-side of the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the greatest commandment, love your, well, that's A-side, heads of that coin. Love God with, with all, all you got, and then tails is love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest commandment. So the B-side of that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, your employers, your employees, they're your neighbors especially if you're both part of the Christian church. So these are things that Paul is talking about. Authority is in mind here. What is the example, the authority example of the church towards um, each other to display towards the, uh, to display for the looking public? You know, what are they supposed to see in us? How are they supposed to uh, get the picture of what God is like by watching us? And that, that's part of it. These instructions are all part of that there. Um, whether you're an employee or employer, you have a great responsibility to do right by the other for Christ's sake because of Him and because of your relationship with Him. So that's where I want to pull the cord on chapter 6 today. Uh, I want to wait on the rest of chapter 6 because it all kind of fits together in a good package. We'll wait on that for next week. We'll pick up on verse 10 then. So uh, he starts with a final word. But that final word is like everything. So the, your job assignment this week, go back to Ephesians 1, 1, and read up to this point. Because everything that he has talked about in that whole letter starts off whenever he gets to therefore in this one. So remember the therefore and what it's there for. All the things that he has commanded up until that point that he has taught you uh, about how you're to live in this world. So all of the first five chapters and the first half of chapter six are all part of that. In light of all of what I've just said now, put on the full armor of God. And we'll learn about that next week. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your protection and your guidance and direction. And Lord, we thank you for including us 
in all that you command here in these verses of the teaching that we, every one of us can find ourselves in there uh, somewhere. And thank you for this guidance. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak a little louder sometimes to us so that we can hear you more clearly. But help us, help us to have our ears open to hear what you're telling us so that we can be guided by you and live in the Spirit and not in the flesh. That's the thing that we struggle with the most in this life, Lord, every one of us. I thank you for this possibility and for your guidance and protection. And all these things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Lord be with you all as you go.